Previously on the Fan of History, Assyria had a major civil war and Shamshi Adad V won the civil war but only with the help of Babylon and he had to agree to pretty bad treaty with Babylon. Queen Dido of Tyre fled from her brother the king together with some disgruntled nobles who didn't like the way Pygmalion ran, ran Tyre. There were some hijacked servants and 80 sacred prostitutes and they are now traveling all over the Mediterranean looking for a place to live. Welcome to the fan of history. I am the fan of history and I'm just the fan of history. If you want to know more about the sources, check out the video about our sources. Uh, if you think something is wrong in a video, please let me know. I want to learn. I think everything I'm saying here is truthful, but uh, I'm no historian, so I could be wrong. There is a previous video you should watch before this, and it is Events of the 820s BC, Part 2, The Flight of Dido. So, Shamshi Adad V is the king of the new Assyrian Empire. This is the strongest state in the Near East and probably the strongest state, ah, the second strongest state in the world next to Sul China. Uh, Shamshi Adad is trying to recover from the civil war. He is the fifth king of the empire, but this great period of unrest has caused uh, the vassal states, especially in the west in Syria, to uh, just stop paying tribute because the Assyrians are not there beating them up. Uh, our sources are mainly from Assyria and these sources get a lot worse with the start of Shamshi Adad's reign. They will also get uh, even worse later on. So we're not gonna get the full details of Ashur Nasir Pal II and Shalmaneser III going forward. So in 819 BC, Shamshi Adad V attacks and he attacks uh, to the north because the biggest threat to Assyria is the rising power of Urartu. The proto-Armenian kingdom uh, centered around uh, Lake Van in what is today Turkey. It's the Nairi Sea on this map. Uh, Shamshi Adad raids to the north. Uh, there's also the Manians living east of Lake Urmia to the lower right on the map. But this is problematic for the Assyrians because uh, Urartu is just growing stronger and it's protected by strong mountain fortresses. And there is a ridiculous claim by Shamshi Adad V that he won, he conquered 300 cities and took a lot of horse etc. But this might just be a glorified horse raid because it really accomplishes nothing in the greater scheme of things. So the king of Babylon, Marduk Sakir Shumi, dies at some point and 819 BC is the best guess. Uh, it is probably in the first half of the 810s BC. Remember this guy? He was put on the throne by the former Assyrian king Shalmaneser III and he put Shamshi Adad V on the throne of Assyria. But he did so in a whole other way than Shalmaneser put him on the throne because now Assyria is inferior to Babylon in the formal treaty. This guy has been ruling for a long time uh, but his Babylonia has declined since the reign of his powerful father. He is replaced by Marduk Balassu Ipki, his son, and this guy is probably quite old. He is recorded on this Kuduru that you see in the picture. It's 25 years before Marduk Balassu Ipki becomes the king and is noted as Marduk Balassu Ipki, son of the king. The nobles of Babylon are starting to have hereditary positions and royal authority is weakening. This guy is also the brother of Queen Semiramis then, or Shamuramat, the queen of Assyria, the wife of Shamshi Adad. And we'll talk a lot more about Se Queen Semiramis next time on Fan of History. So in 818 BC, Assyria attacks again, led by Mutaris Ashur. Wait, what? 
Who is this guy? He's not a Turtano, he's not a field marshal of Syria, he's the Rab Saki. And it seems to me that Rab Saki means the Grand Vizier. He's like the prime advisor of the king, Shamshi Adad. Uh, and he's in command, so the king is doing something else. And this is probably just another campaign that doesn't accomplish anything. He says, um, Shamshi Adad says that the campaign goes to Nairi, there were horses taken. And it might just be another horse day. Remember when Ashur Nasipal and Shalmaneser totally crushed Urartu several times? They just swept through the land of Urartu, set up stele on the Nairi Sea and just beat everybody. But those days are over and the Syrian army can't even get into Urartu proper. In 818 BC there is a great meeting in China. Uh, King Chuan calls a meeting of all the lords and uh, they are probably happy that he's not a tyrant like his father. He was raised by the Gonghe Regency and he seems to be doing a decent job of being a just king. But he's not a strong king and the barbarians are disturbing the borders of China. So Su, China in trouble but still in the Western Chu period. Okay. Now we're going to get confusing and strange. And this is the part where I hope that somebody will correct me. The dates are uncertain and it's all very unclear what is actually going on in Egypt. But there is some material, so we are going to talk about it. So, we have three pharaohs. Pedabas I rules Thebes and the western desert oasis. And he's of the 23rd dynasty. Takilot II, uh, the, the second rules uh, other parts of southern Egypt. He is supposed to rule Thebes, but Pedibas has taken Thebes from him. And different sources put Takilot in the 22nd or the 23rd dynasty. These guys are all Libyans, and tw the 22nd dynasty is uh, the Libyan dynasty. But everybody who rebels against the real rulers are labeled as the 23rd dynasty in some sources. And Takilot II has also rebelled against the northern pharaoh, who is the only pure 22nd dynasty pharaoh, Sheshonk III. We have one decent source for this period, and it's our man on the ground. The guy who is going to be called Osorkon III. And here he is, pushing his little car cart, doing his thing. Usar Matre, Sete Panamun, Osorkon III, Ciesa. He is probably at this point the crown prince of the south, to Takilot II. And he's trying to reclaim Thebes. He's probably the leading person in Takilot II's army. He's also the high priest of Amun, if you obey Takilot II. And a guy called Haris B is the actual high priest of Amun under Pedubast in Thebes. Osorkon has three children. Shepenupet by his wife Karaujet and Takilot III and Rudamun by his wife Tensai. There is a civil war raging in the south of Egypt for this entire decade. Uh, Osorkon III wrote a great chronicle of his life. He lives a long time. There is a lot of text about his life. I found the quotes from the chronicle but I haven't found the text of the chronicle itself. So if you can help me find this, let me know. Uh, three pharaohs are probably not enough, so there is also dissension in the delta uh, to the north, especially close to Libya. Because the great chiefs of the Libyan war tribes are getting restless and they're more and more autonomous, not listening to Shoshenk III. So there are like, several competing dynasties with people that pay lip service to Shoshenk. They date their stuff in the years of the rules of Shoshenk III. But they are the great chiefs of the Ma and they are not really doing what Shoshenk wants, Shoshenk wants them to do. So I'll probably need a drink after this, but this confusion in Egypt is not over <laughs> by a long shot, so it will go on. In 815 BC, Shamshi Adad V attacks Nairi again, or Urartu. And probably the same thing, horse raid, not much happens. And this campaign in particular is quite poorly documented. Uh, Urartu doesn't seem to uh, mind the Assyrian attacks at all this time. 
because the king Ishpuini he conquers Musasir. Musasir is to the lower right here. It is important religious center, and Musasir has been a strong ally of Urartu for some years now. But now Ishpuini takes it over, and maybe this was why Shamshadad campaigned to the north to try to prevent this, because Musasir is even closer to Assyria proper. But Shamshadad will not turn north again in this decade. And Ishpuini and his son Menua, who is his co-regent, will have free reign of the north. Musasir is the site of the god Kaldi and his wife Arubani. And Kaldi will soon become, if he isn't already, the chief god of the Urartian pantheon. And he is confusingly like Asher, the leading god of Assyria. He's a god of war. He wants his king to be his high priest. He wants the king to go on campaign every year. His temple is called the House of Weapons. And it's a house filled with weapons. But next time we will discuss Urartian religion in the uh, events of the 809 to 800 BC episode. It's actually not next time, but it's upcoming. But we have to talk about the Kelashin Stele. Because Ishpuini and Minua commemorates this event, the taking of Musasir, in a stele. So, it stands in the pass of Kelishin between Rovandus and Lake Urmia. This is a remote region and it was a particularly remote region in the 19th century. And the discovery of this stele was an important part of the story of the rediscovery of Urartu. Because this kingdom was lost. All of the sources we have are Urartian and Assyrian, and these were not known in 1827 when Friedrich Eduard Schultz found this stele in the remote mountains. And he tried to return to it, but he was killed by Kurdish bandits. And a lot of other people went to look for this stele that told of this unknown civilization that seemed very powerful, but they were all killed by Kurdish bandits. So there was a certain time of year when the bandits were heading home, that you could reach the stele. But it took until 1951, when a guy called Cameron found the stele, managed to uh, document parts of it, but it was covered in ice and really hard to read. So it wasn't fully detailed until 1976 by some Italians, and they had heavy military protection to get to this remote area. The stele tells the story of the conquest of Musasir by Ishpuini and Minua. Meanwhile, in Tyre, you see Tyre to the lower left of the map. This is the leading city of the Phoenicians, the mighty trading people of the Levant. They trade all over the Mediterranean and they were forced to increase their colonization efforts and their trade by the Assyrian Empire. But now, since 827 BC, the Assyrians have not been around. But the Phoenicians are onto a good thing here. So they just keep doing what they do. They keep colonizing, they keep trading, get, they are getting richer and richer. But remember, Dido fled from Tyre, bringing along her late husband's extensive treasure. And she's now rich and has a lot of people with her. And where is she going? Well. She is going to some place to settle down. But this whole story is clouded in legend. It's only been recently confirmed to be approximately in this time. So I talked to, uh, this is a shout out to the Facebook site History of Carthage. And uh, they cleared my dating of this event to happen here in uh, 816 BC actually. So we're talking about the founding of Carthage. This city will become the most important Phoenician city and it will become the great rival of the Greeks and of the Romans for control of the Mediterranean. So Dido and her party lands at the site of Carthage. And there is a legend about an ox side there. There's a, a king of a Libyan tribe who controls the area and they say, well, we want to settle down here. Please, mighty king, let us settle down here. And this has worked for the Phoenicians before, but the king says, no, you can only uh, put the colony in an area that you can cover with this oxide. So Dido just cuts the oxide into long, long uh, 
<laughs> rope pretty much and then she covers the hill of Bursa. But Bursa means like hill fortress or something in Greece, uh, in Greek. So this is probably just a confused thing. Uh, and it probably did not happen. The next legend about the local king is that he was so impressed by Dido setting up this colony, tricking him with the oxide, etc., that he demands that she marries him. But she doesn't want to desecrate the memory of a late husband and uncle, Acerbas, so she kills herself. And that is the end of Dido, according to legend. But archaeology confirms that this colony is established sometime between 840 and 800 BC. And uh, yeah, History of Carthage on Facebook, check it out. They gave me permission to use 816 BC as the date. So Carthage will be around now, from now on, starting as a small Phoenician colony. Um, we have to talk about the other legend of Dido. This is the great work of Virgil, the poet of Augustus's age in Rome. So Augustus tells Virgil to make a great poem for the Romans, as great as the Iliad and the Odyssey, so the Romans can have pride and to finally straighten out the fact that Rome has two foundation myths. This happens uh, <laughs> right before the birth of Jesus. So uh, Virgil pretty much rips off the Odyssey. Aeneas, the pious, is a Trojan prince who frees from the, uh, flees from the sack of Troy and he follows in the footsteps of Odysseus and when he gets to Sicily he's going to try to get to Italy but he ends up in a storm and lands in Carthage and there is Dido setting up uh, Carthage and they fall madly in love and have a great time together but the gods are upset and they are like Aeneas we gave you a mission you have to go and found a very important city for the future. So uh, Aeneas has to leave and he sneaks away from Carthage and Dido is super upset and throws herself from a tower onto the rocks or burns herself and she kills herself again so maybe maybe she killed herself in real life but she's very suicidal in the legends. But before she dies she says rise up from my bones avenging spirit referring to Hannibal and this is Virgil's attempt to uh, explain why Hannibal could beat up Rome so much but this is much much later and we will not talk about the real history of Rome until 616 BC as I said before there were no no infants being suckled by wolves there probably wasn't even uh, an Alba Longa but uh, yeah, back to Carthage. Uh, the connection to Tyre remains and every year Carthage will pay a tribute to Tyre. And people will go on a journey to Tyre and be like, whoa, this is our home, it's really cool, and make offerings at the temple. But eventually Carthage will grow bigger than Tyre and uh, it will become the most important Phoenician city in the Mediterranean. And the main reason for this is that the Phoenicians will feel the need to flee their homeland in the Levant. They've been around for thousands of years, trading, doing great things in the Levant. But in the next century, a lot of Phoenician nobles and powerful traders, merchants, etc. will flee. Why will they flee the Levant? Way. Well, they will encounter the Assyrian. Back in Rartu, Ishpuini is doing great things. He dedicates a new cult center at the newly captured city of Musasir. He moves the cult of Kaldi to Tushpa, his capital. He changes the, uh, the, the religious site in Musasir to the god Ardini, who is a minor god. But at some point the name of Musasir changes back. He changes the name of the city to Ardini as well. But Musasir will be around again as Musasir. So I don't know why, when the name changes back. Kaldi is the major god of Rartu now and there will be more religion next time. 
Ishpuini and Menoa, this great father and son team, uh, kings of Urartu, they build several fortresses next to Lake Urmia, guarding their borders against the Manians. They build a lot of fortresses guarding their border against Assyria. They guard Tushpa with mighty mountain fortresses. And they do a lot of architecture that can still be seen today in Armenia and Turkey. And they directly threaten the newly arisen Manian kingdom to the east of Lake Urmia. So there's a triangle going on there between Assyria in the southwest, uh, Urartu to the north and the Manians to the southeast. But to the north of Urartu, where they conquered some mini kingdoms, um, there lives a lot of people in the Caucasus and they live in small, small kingdoms. And the Urartu really despise them. They think the Manians and the Assyrians, they're like, oh, they are civilizations. Um, they are great kingdoms, but the people of the north are just stupid barbarians. But the people of the north, they are holding the horse hordes from the steppes out of Mesopotamia. Because the Cimmerian horde is rampaging the steppes, it's really powerful. But further east, there is another barbarian horse lord horde called the Scythians, and they are pressuring the Cimmerians. So Eastern Cimmeria is a bad place for the Cimmerians and the Cimmerians are starting to look say hey, where else can we go? We don't want to fight the Scythians. They are really bad, but these guys who live in the Caucasus oh, They seem to have some sort of trouble in the south So if Urartu really takes over the Caucasus Who will help them stop the barbarians to the north? So Urartu can the good idea for Urartu now is to expand west into what is today Turkey or east into Manian, uh, Persian, Median territory. Uh, it's hard to expand to the south because there is Assyria and Assyria is still the most powerful kingdom in the Near East. So that's the Urartian situation when we leave uh, the early 810s BC. Next episode will be part two of the 810s and we'll meet another queen who is even more famous than Dido but whose legends are even more far out. They are really far out. We will meet Semiramis, Queen of the World. I do this weekly, this decade reports every week. You can discuss the show with me on YouTube or on Facebook. You can check out our website. Uh, please subscribe to this YouTube channel, like the videos, share the videos with your friends because that is what helps me keep going. I'm doing this because it's fun. And getting attention is always fun, so please help me get some attention. Thank you for watching.